Let's pray. Father, we come to you tonight, Lord, and we are mindful that um, our lives are very short, God, in, in view of um, history, God. I mean, it's a vapor, as David writes. Father, tonight I ask that you would open our hearts to give us eyes to see and ears to hear. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Your word sustains us. It enriches us. It fills us. It directs us, God. So thank you that we have the opportunity to have the word which is alive. Bless our time together, Lord. Bless these brief moments that we're in the word together. God, may it transform us, Lord. And we thank you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And all the church said. So we are in Matthew chapter 5. And as we discussed last week, we're just kind of reviewing a little bit. Uh, we call these the Beatitudes, but in reality, the, the word Beatitudes really means blessed or blessings. And so these are blessings, and they follow, they follow a benedictive pattern where um, you, you do this, or you'll get this if you do X, Y, and Z, right? And so that's basically what the Beatitudes are telling us. And it's important to note that uh, Matthew and Luke... They, they say the same thing. Um, uh, these are called the synoptic gospels because they parallel each other. But remember, I sp- uh, last week I explained that Luke's rendition of the Beatitudes, it says that Jesus, he says Jesus is on the plain. So Jesus is not speaking on a mountain in Luke's rendition. He's speaking in a flat place on the, in a plain. Um, Matthew, however, he tells us that Jesus is on a mountaintop. And so the reason that you have these two different events is because they're two different events. And it appears in the Gospels, and especially in, uh, especially in the uh, early church commentary, that Jesus used the Beatitudes as a platform to speak to people multitudes of times. So we're not looking at just this one-and-done event, but Jesus has done it multiple times. And as we talked about last week, Jesus is speaking directly to his disciples. Now, other people are within earshot of what Jesus is saying, but it was never directed towards them. This is directed towards his disciples. And as I told you last week, think of Sermon on the Mount as Matthew's rendition of Jesus' greatest hits. And that Matthew condenses all the things that Jesus has said, and especially around the Beatitudes and the different times that it's been spoken. He just places it in this one event for us to kind of understand uh, what Jesus was doing and saying. So we'll pick up where we left off last week. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 5, verse 5. It reads, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. This is one of the most quoted of the Beatitudes in the Bible, and it's probably one of the most misunderstood of the Beatitudes in the Bible. Now, Jesus is directly quoting from Psalm 37 and, and from verses 10 and 11. Um, let's go to Psalm 37, 10. It says, in just a little while, the wicked will be no more. And though you look carefully at his place, he will not be there, but the meek now, that word in the Hebrew is anav, shall inherit the land. And that word in, in Hebrew is eretz. And in the Greek, it's gen or gen. And it says he, he will, excuse me, the meek shall inherit the land and delight themselves in abundant peace. So Jesus is quoting from this psalm here. And he's using some distinct verbiage. Now, while English translations tend to universalize this beatitude with reference to inheriting the whole earth, this is not the context in which Jesus is speaking. The original context of the Psalms refers to land, and specifically the land of Israel. As I said, the word for land in Hebrew is eretz, and in Greek it's gen, And gen is exactly the word that Matthew uses here in his um, statement of what Jesus says there on the mountain. Now, we know that what Jesus is talking about as far as the land being the nation of Israel or the land of Israel, 
we recognize it's because there's combinations of meek and land elsewhere in Israel's scripture. So a little side note for you before we, we take a closer look. When we read in English the earth, we tend to think of the globe. But Jesus is not speaking of the earth or the globe itself. Remember, he is talking to his disciples. His disciples are Jewish. And the land of Israel was everything to the Jewish people. It was the promised land. The earth was never promised to them. Only the promised land. Only the land of Canaan. And think about it. Everything revolves around the land of Israel. Look at, look at it today. Israel is constantly in the news. Constantly in the news. Israel is the timepiece for all that God is doing and working. And so here's the thing, is that if you look at Iran and a lot of the Middle Eastern nations, their desire is to see the land of Israel and the Jews destroyed or taken away. So when Jesus references here, they shall inherit the earth, the correct word is land. He is referencing the land. I'll give you another example. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, it says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Well, that word there for earth is eretz, and it means land. God created the land. Here's the thing, and this is what I tell you about translations, how you have to go back to the original translation, the original word, is that it became earth when the King James Version was translated. They translated it to earth, but the actual word is land. Does it change anything? I believe it does. Because what Jesus is saying here, verse 5, is distinctly to the Jews that he was talking to, the disciples, and that the nation of Israel, the land of Israel, was going to remain theirs. Now, key thing to remember, this word inherit. Again, what is the, what is the meaning of this word? Well, this word means, it means to keep. So when you inherit some, something, right, you're, you're basically keeping it within the family, right? It's being passed down from father to son or mother to daughter or cousin or whatever, but typically it stays within the family lineage. And so when Jesus says that you will inherit the earth, he's saying, or the, na or the land, he's saying you will keep it. Why? Because it's already been given to them. It's been given to them multiple times in the Bible. If you remember, Abraham first got the land. Then Jacob got the land. Then it came, the, the nation of Israel came back after Egypt, and then they got the land again. And then they were taken away into Babylonian and Assyrian captivity, and then they got the land again. It's always their land, and it always will be their land, and there's nothing that anybody on earth can do to change that. So Jesus tells them here, he says that blessed are the meek, for they are going to inherit the land. We see another reference to this in Zephaniah about inheriting the land. Zephaniah chapter 2, verse 3 says this, Seek the Lord, all you meek, same word there that was used in Psalms, adav, of the earth, eretz, who have upheld justice. It says, Seek righteousness, seek humility. It may be that you will be hidden in the day of the Lord's anger. For Gaza shall be forsaken, and Eshkelon desolate. They shall drive out Ashdod at noonday, and Ekron shall be uprooted. So what is, what is the prophet saying here? He's saying, seek the Lord, all you who are meek. All you who are meek. All you who are looking for justice. All you who have are seeking righteousness. And in that day, when God's going to come and uproot these other nations, who are these other nations? These are nations that are around Israel. These are all Philistine, Philistinian nations. And so these cities, these nations, these, these 
pagan countries that are around them, it says here in that time that they are going to be driven out. They're going to be uprooted. They're going to be gone. And the only one that's going to continue to be there in the land that they inherited is the nation of Israel. So what does the word meek mean? Anybody know what the word meek means? Well, if you've been in certain circles, you may have heard the idea behind the word meek as being strength under control, like a strong stallion that was trained to do the job instead of running wild, right? I mean, that's what, that's what we're told. Unfortunately, that's an, that's an inaccurate interpretation of what this word is. The word for meek in Greek is Pray us, pray us. It's only used three times in the New Testament. And here's the thing. Meek means exactly as it sounds. It's, it's a mild or a mildness of disposition, and it's a gentleness of spirit. That's what it is. And here's what we need to understand. This meekness, this meek that, that Jesus is speaking of, it has everything to do with God. Everything to do with God. In essence, it's a meekness toward God. That's disposition is one in the spirit where you accept God's dealings. You accept them as good. And therefore, you, you don't dispute, you don't resist. You just know that God has your best interests at heart all the time. In the Old Testament, the meek are those who are relying on God rather than their own strength to defend against injustice. That's what the meek are in the Old Testament. This, this meekness, right, uh, it's, it's a meekness towards evil people. And, and it, it's a, a meekness that knows that God is permitting whatever injury is being inflicted on you, whatever injustice is being inflicted on you, and that he's using it to purify you and me, and that one day he will deliver us in his time. Gentleness or meekness is the opposite to self-assertiveness and self-interest. It stems from trust in God's goodness and control over the situation. That's what it means to be meek. The gentle or meek person, they're not occupied with their self at all. There's no self in it. They realize that this is a work of the Holy Spirit and not a work of human will. Paul alludes to this in Galatians chapter 5, verse 23. So church, in essence, meekness is an attitude towards God that reflects our trust in Him. We trust Him. We trust Him with our lives. We, we trust Him with our family's lives. We trust Him with our friends. We trust that God is always going to do what's right in the end. It may not feel right when you're going through it. But Jesus says, man, you need to be meek. You need to be gentle. You need to be humble. Because if you are, then and only then can you inherit the land. Right? Right? No need to take up your sword. Well, I'm not a pushover. People aren't going to tell me what to do, right? People aren't going to walk all over me. Well, Jesus said something different. He said, man, if they tell you to go one mile, you go two. See, in Rome, a Roman citizen could ask anybody who was a non-Roman citizen to pick up whatever they were carrying the Roman person was carrying, and they could have that person carry it for one mile. That was the law. Jesus says, if they tell you to do that, go too. He says, man, if they take you to court and try to take your jacket, give them, give them your cloak. He says, man, if they strike you on the right side, give them the left side. See, Jesus' way of handling things is far different than our way. And it's only a meek spirit, a meek and humble spirit that is able to act accordingly in those situations. 
The sad reality, church, is that Jesus was warning his disciples and warning those with an earshot of how they needed to act. Encouraging them to remember what the Psalms and the prophets had said. Because the Roman Empire was starting to put a lot of pressure on the nation of Israel. A lot of pressure on them. Times were getting tough with Rome. But he said, man, if you remain meek and humble before God and before men, then God will prevail. But unfortunately, they did not listen. And 40 years later, the Romans came in and literally crushed the nation of Israel. One million Jews were crucified along the roadside going into Jerusalem. The temple was utterly destroyed. Jesus said, not one, not one stone will be left unturned, and there wasn't. They burned it, and they ripped it to pieces. And the nation of Israel was no more until 1948. Oh, how they may have wanted to listen to what Jesus said. And it's the same message to us. Church, stop trying to fight everything and fight everyone and fight out. Listen, either we believe that the battle belongs to the Lord or we don't. Either we believe the Lord is the strength in our salvation or we don't. Either we believe that God is going to take care of us or we don't. There is no halfway with God. And one thing I took from this as I was getting ready for this message is that I can't be wishy-washy in my thinking on that. God is in control, and we need to stay meek and humble. And when we do, whatever God has for us to inherit, we will. Whatever he has given us that is ours, we will keep it and will not be taken away. So, the desire of the one who has poverty of spirit, the one who is mourning for sin, and the one who is meek or as is it has a meek spirit well those are the ones that will thirst after righteousness and that's where jesus goes next matthew chapter 5 6 he says blessed are those who are hungry and thirst for righteousness for they shall be satisfied church this is a beautiful beautiful verse and a beautiful promise but it's one that needs to be fully comprehended as far as what jesus is saying First, you need to understand that this hunger and this thirst that Jesus is talking about, it cannot be satisfied on a snack or some, some little niblet, okay? It, it, it needs to be, you, you need to, listen, if you're hungry, right, all a snack does is tie you over. That's all it does. Like when I'm hungry and I take a snack, it just ties me over. But when I sit down for the real meal, I get my eat on. Well, Jesus is talking about a hunger and thirst to where you're just not snacking a little bit. Some of you just snack a little. You snack a little bit on the word over here, or you snack a little bit on some Christian music, or you might snack with a little bit of dialogue about Jesus, but you're just snacking. But church, Jesus is telling us, I want you to get filled up on me. This is a longing for righteousness that cannot be completely fulfilled on this side of eternity, but it can be fulfilled. Why? Because he says it. But here's what you need to understand. It's based on a deep longing, compassion, and passion for Christ. And it needs to be a real passion. It cannot be something conjured up. It can't be something that's fake. It has to be something that's just inside of you to where you want it so much. It's like when you're hungry, thinking about it. This passion is real, just like hunger and thirst are real. When you're hungry and you're thirsty, it's real. It's not something you fake. Nobody fakes being hungry. This passion, it's natural. Just like the hunger and thirst are natural in a healthy person. This passion is intense, just like hunger and thirst can be. You ever had that where you got that, in, that just that intense passion that you just got to eat because your thirst or your hunger is so great? This passion can be painful. Have you ever had it where you did not eat for a while and you have hunger pains? 
It's the same type of, of intensity, painful intensity that you can encounter when you're hungry and thirsty and it causes you pain. This passion is a driving force, just like hunger and thirst can drive a man or a woman. And this passion is a sign of health, just like hunger and thirst show you're healthy. This is the kind of thing that Jesus taught. This is the drive Jesus is talking about, the drive for what? Righteousness. For righteousness. Church, we see Christ followers hunger after a lot of things, man. They hunger after a lot of things. They hunger after power. They hunger after, pay, after fame, authority, success, comfort, happiness. But how many of us in this room tonight truly hunger after righteousness? After righteousness. That's deep. That's deep. To be hungry for righteousness. To be hungry to go after righteousness. And how does this hunger and thirst for righteousness express itself? A man may long to have a righteous nature. And from that, a man wants to be sanctified and to be made more holy. And then when that begins to happen, a man starts to long to continue to stay close to God and close to God and, and close to his righteousness. And once a man has, has come to that point or a woman, then they long to see right, righteousness promoted in the world. Do we tonight truly desire to have righteousness promoted in this world? That's only a question that you and I can answer on our own. But, I mean, I don't know. I mean, this, this verse really had me kind of perplexed. I'm still kind of, I'm up here just not even clear on my own thoughts on this right now. Because this verse is such a dynamic verse. To hunger and thirst for righteousness. Charles Spurgeon said this. He said, he hungers and thirsts after righteousness. He does not hunger and thirst after his own political party that may get into power. But he does hunger and thirst that righteousness may be done in the land. He does not hunger and thirst that his own opinions may come to the front. And that his own sect or denomination may increase in numbers and influence. But he does desire that righteousness may come to the fore. Think about that, man. Do, do, do you and I live like this? Do we really live like this? Right? I mean, what is it? Chris, you say this all the time. Who you are is who you are when you're alone. That's who you really are. Because we come here and we fake it, man. We fake it really good. I know I can. I'm, I'm good at it. I know how to speak Christianese and I know how to Talk to talk, walk to walk, do all that kind of stuff, man. I know how to, yeah, God's good and all that. And then, you know, when I'm alone, but who am I when I'm alone? And who are you? We should be men and women that are seeking after righteousness. Not our own, but his. Then Jesus says, for they shall be satisfied. Jesus promised to satisfy that hunger. He promises to give you as much as you can eat. If you want a whole lot of righteousness, Jesus says, I'm going to give it to you. But you got to really want it, and you got to really desire it. Church, how much are we longing for not only Jesus, but also his righteousness? Because here's the thing I want you to understand. People want Jesus. Man, they want what, what Jesus promises, man. Yeah, I'm getting a ticket, man. I'm getting a ticket into eternity. I get, I, if, I get, if I get my Jesus on, I ask him into my life, and I have a relationship, man, ooh, it's all good. But after that, what do they want to do? They want to live their own lives. Live for me, not he. That's our motto. I'll take, I'll take the Savior part, Jesus, but I don't want the Lord part. I don't, I don't like that word. I like Savior because Savior is going to keep me out of where I don't want to be. But I don't like Lord, because Lord means that I got to listen to you, and I got to obey you. 
and I've got to follow you. And you know what? If you tell me that I'm going to inherit the earth if I, if I hunger and thirst for righteousness, then I need to change my attitude and my thinking with you. And I need to say, God, if I'm not there, why aren't I there? Jesus is going to remind his disciples of what righteousness is later in this chapter when we get to uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 20. And that whole thing with the Pharisees when he says, your righteousness needs to exceed the Pharisees, church, we have no idea what that means. It's not what you think. In closing, righteousness is our pedigree. It's our pedigree. It's what makes us recognizable, right? If you saw my dog, you would know what kind of a dog it is. If you saw Dennis's dog, you'd know what kind of a dog it is. If you saw Claude and Jen's dog, you would guess what kind of a dog it is. I mean, you know, I don't know, but you know. But I'm just saying, my point is, is that it's our pedigree. It, it shows who we are. And Jesus says he'll satisfy that hunger and thirst while we're here on earth. But we will still long for more. And it won't be complete until Jesus' return. Church, are we looking for his return today? Are we? Do we desire to have him in place as ruler of the earth? Do we really, I mean, are you really, really ready for what Jesus is going to bring? But he's going to bring a radical change. It's going to be real radical. It's going to be real different. It's going to be a trip. Right? Now, I personally believe, it's just a personal observation, that as I continue to read and study, that Jesus is, prepare, is preparing each and every one of us for that moment when he does return. He's got us in training. And if we're not training ourselves now, it's going to be a shock when he comes. It's going to be a shock at the things he's going to institute and things that he's going to change. He's going to be a gracious and loving ruler. He's still the lamb who takes away the sins of the world. But he is going to rule. And he's going to rule, rule in righteousness and in justice. And so tonight, when you go home, ask yourself, am I meek and am I hungry and thirsty for righteousness? Because church, those building blocks are absolutely 100% necessary for us to be who we need to be in Christ. Amen.